All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Liu, and I am the Python Technical Consultant Engineer at Intel. Um, so normally, a lot of my focus is on the numerical and scientific side, but occasionally, uh, you know, I, I have a, a big pass in my work in infrastructure. So, you know, on that topic, I've come up with some interesting ways of using BuildBot, and so I thought I'd give you a chat on how, how I've done that. So just kind of as an overview, um, we're going to just talk about it, uh, what, what you can do and what I mean by infrastructure design patterns, what BuildBot is. Um, we're going to talk about um, hooking things up in unusual ways with ports and multi-masters and pseudo uh, remote procedure calls. And then drop into when, when to use containers, putting it all together with Python, and then talking about some more like live examples and things that I've actually implemented um, in the real world. So. Just on the term of infrastructure, I know this term gets thrown around a lot. Um, what exactly is automate? Uh, was what exactly is infrastructure? Is it automation? Is it orchestration? Are you talking in task runners or distributed task runners? I think there's a lot of confusion as to what this actually is, uh, and many options actually exist in in the Python world for what you may need. So um, you can have Dask, uh, IPy Parallel, and Joblib, which are more distributed task runners for numerical work. Um, you have orchestration with Chef and Puppet. Um, you have Celery and Kafka, which are also um, heavily tied in with Python that are more automated task um, scheduler runners. So many of these examples are very heavy handed. So like they'll do a lot, but you have a lot of setup because they're not necessarily um, meant for this specific task. So uh, you, you usually have one solution that's way, way too, too complicated for the job that you're actually using it for. So some examples of, what, of these really odd things where it's too heavy handed would be a distributed task system such as Dask, which I really, really love to run a cron job, which is completely out of the scope of what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so it's not a good use case. Trying to get Celery to do a, ma uh, a map reduce operation, which it generally doesn't like to do, um, or trying to get Puppet to make a task graph. So these are all examples of when you basically have um, competing features that don't, uh, that don't exactly fit under the paradigm of whatever task you're doing. So you're using these frameworks against what they were designed for. So to get out of that mentality of using you know, just those big pieces, just to kind of force them into a certain direction of what you want, I, the way that I've approached it is to take other frameworks that are loose enough that you can use as building blocks to get that. So one of the ones that I use is BuildBot, which is normally used for continuous integration. And it's written in Python and uses Twisted as, as its back end. Uh, it's been pretty popular because it builds the actual Python language and I think a few other languages like Rust. Um, and you can construct elements of it in really weird ways. So just like Lego blocks, you can just take pieces, bits and pieces, and arrange them in an odd order to get the job done. So continuous integration or CI tasks generally you know, inc uh, incorporate a lot of interesting pieces. You have a scheduler, you have dependencies, and you usually have some type of result at the end that you're trying to achieve. Um, but the main task components are actually composed of other primitives that you can break up into smaller pieces and utilize if you choose the right, um, the right pieces. So some of these, the examples of these pieces are what you see up here. Um, some of the more notable ones are uh, like triggers, resource pools, um, distributed system communications, the scheduler itself, um, build steps. So a lot of these you've probably seen if you've ever done any type of continuous integration or build. Um, so uh, when you look at these components, you know, in your head, you think, okay, this is meant for this, this is meant for this, but what I'm going to hopefully show you today is that you can do a lot more with some of the components that I'm demonstrating up here. Um, so one of the things that is unusual about BuildBot is that because all the things are split up, they give you the option to wire them in unusual ways, and that's when they reveal that upper layer to you, normally you're like, for Jenkins or Team City, you're like, okay, I'm just using it in this, in this format. But if you start to break out the pieces and say, well, I want the scheduler reporting to another scheduler, then reporting to something else, then you, you achieve some design flexibility. Um, so before I go on to, there's a huge, huge warning as, as someone who is formerly in like the security field, the examples I'm about to show implement zero security. And before you ever put this in production, or, or anywhere internally, just understand that there is very, very little security or orchestration that's going on. So just, just understand that before. And this is considered a very off use of BuildBot. So don't go, you know, 
asking the BuildBot people, hey, how can I set it up for this, config this really weird off-the-wall configuration? Because it's probably a not a supported use case. So um, the first steps in breaking out of um, just the CI mindset would be that the, the design patterns are, are most, you take the most common tasks and roles and interconnects that, that occur in software deployment. So you take a look and say, well, what type of roles are, are always there? Um, and BuildBot is, again, just one way of, of solving this. So if you, use, if you use it, you can just prototype something and then develop something else when you go to production. So some examples of what I've actually implemented and what I'll show you as an example, I've, I've uh, listed up here. Um, enterprise application deployment and license management is, has been two of the most popular uses um, that, I've, that I've made proof of concepts for, so we'll go into that in a sec, but there's other things that have been done before. Um, so let's talk about what you, what you actually need to start doing this. So BuildBot has a lot of interesting components when you need to actually work with a, with a, with a worker and a master. And one of the things it exposes is ports, but you can use the way that it exposes it in a non-standard way. So what I, what I actually do is the change port in, in BuildBot allows you to normally say, well, I want to trigger a build term from an external source. But what I'm going to show you is that you can use a symlink call to a Python script, which then gives you a kind of a user level trigger to trigger a whatever you want. So it gives you that, that very much, like, a, like if you map something to user bin, to it, you could actually launch an application. So um, by passing the argument I can, uh, of those um, through that Python script, I can also kind of remote procedure call into the worker because the worker is just interpreting it as Python and the port through the, through the password. So you can actually inject Python code. Again, you know, sanitize your inputs here, but you can do some really weird things with it. Um, and most of that logic is controlled through the master.cfg, um, which is in majority interpreted as Python code. So here's an example of what it actually looks like. Um, in the Python, in the master.cfg, you normally have a change source, right? Um, and you, you usually ask it to pull from a repository. Oh, I'm pulling this repository all the time. Okay, that's great. You know, if someone someone checks something, it'll it'll update. But then you can actually add a secondary change source, and that's the method that I'm about to show you. Is I'm adding that secondary change source on a port and then injecting commands into it. So one of the files that you can use is the fake change.py that they ship in the buildbot contrib. Um, and what it does is it accesses that port and sends the actual build command to the specific keyword project. So if you create the scheduler for it and you create the, the um, change request for it and match the two together, then uh, you can send that change to the scheduler and then you can trigger whatever you want, be it an application, be it um, you know, a, a task of some type. So I, I know this has been a lot of talking. I know you guys would probably like to see it in action. So here's kind of an example of it running. So in this case, I've actually symlinked um, some, some commands to the Linux, uh, sorry, to the Python script, and I'm, I'm calling it, and it's giving me a result back. And in this case, it's actually running um, one of uh, these, uh, what I would consider a Linux-ish shell in Docker f on, a, on a different worker. So in this case, from one space, I've actually triggered uh, the ability to land a Linux session host or what, you know, in a, in a big compute center uh, right from uh, just, just this simple pattern of injecting that code all the way into there. And I'm then asking it to then build, but in the build, I'm calling um, the, the uh, containerized application to then run to the user. And in that example that I showed, that, that just flashed before you, I showed the actual um, project command um, that was being used in it, which I think was right here. So I was calling it to then say, I want you to build this project, but actually that project is a bunch of Python code that's then calling uh, the Docker application. Um, next, you can think outside of uh, just the standard build process. You can start going into multi-master, um, which creates some really, really odd situations. So you can go from uh, one worker then being load balanced into another worker through like you know either a multi-master setup or a resource pool like situation. So um, 
you know, one of the things that I like to say is don't hesitate to kick off another one of the uh, subsets of build, BuildBot instances. You kind of have to just trust that you've created an abstraction that just you, that mostly works and you can just kind of play around in that space. But occasionally you will have to break out of just a single scheduler or master to achieve the task at hand. Um, to also expand upon what I just said, what type of commands I'm in actually injecting into um, the BuildBot worker uh, is this example. So in this case, I, I am hard setting this, this display variable so you can see what if, if someone's display was passed as an argument during that, during that um, fake change script over, you then assign that to um, the, the command that you're calling on the worker, and then you will be able to call the, the, the entire Docker command. In this case, the top one is for Emacs, and the bottom one is for the, uh, the, the kind of retro terminal that I was showing just a second ago. So again, I can have these intermix even on the same worker with the same build script because uh, you, you're essentially tying each of the commands to a different project of what BuildBot will consider a buildable project. So the reason that I'm even showing parts of Linux containers is that they have the advantage of being uh, great abstractions to things that don't normally fit. So when something really doesn't want to fit together or you have a bunch of dependencies, you can actually use the Linux container systems uh, put together to actually equal a task. And you can you know, you do that through Docker, you can do that through uh, uh, any, any like Rocket or any of the, the, the classic um, uh, container technologies, and in the case that I was showing, I was actually showing uh, Docker with um, with clear containers underneath that prevent it from getting out of the KVM uh, uh, escalation. So, um, with with containers, typically what you want to do is you want to cordon off the riskier bits. So, if you don't want things escalating out, or you don't want um, users mapping things to the volume when you're using the container, then uh, or the application in this case, then this is one way of going it. And another thing that you can actually use is to provide privilege and non-privilege barriers to separate users. Um, so you can make it make sure that you know there's. Uh, uh, there, that that's uh, an application that's very dangerous to something can't be used for uh, can't can't uh, escalate out into something else. Um, and at some point, you you will you may need a, a orchestration to pull off tasks. So just know what responsibilities you want and what technologies. And depending on the problem. Um, it depends, orchestration could, you could, most of the situations I've never had to actually use orchestration to pull something off because I've seen some dangerous things with Puppet. Um, but if you need it or if your organization uses it, then it's something you can consider. Um, and like what I was saying before, if all else fails, just bundle everything up in a, in a container and automate that as a single component. So, you know, in the, in the concept of Python, the reason that this does have a critical component in Python is that the code that you're passing from even your um, script level application that I was showing, the fake change that was symlinked, you can pass in Python code that gets passed into master, which then gets passed in all the way down to the worker. So you're essentially go hopping that code from two or three machines to wherever the resources are. So if you have a very specific build of Python or NumPy, you can pull it off pretty easily um, to, to to get that command over. And Python is, as we know, one of the best glue code uh, capabilities in infrastructure. So that's another reason that um, I think Python has been a very um, critical piece in a lot of the stuff that I've designed. So I'm gonna show off two things. I'm gonna show off the how a company-wide um, server application deployment works. Um, and that's actually, again, using the same mechanism, which is Simlink Python scripts. And then we have the license server for a floating license. So when, if you have, say, an application that has a floating license but it can't get out because of the, uh, like a, a, a company proxy or firewall, then this is one way that you can actually balance that license without having contention on the, the given application resource. Um, so the way that I've designed this first example is that um, you know you have something user bin that's mapped that's mapped to the port change that I just demonstrated, and that c talks to another server. Um, so not 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 like your user computer or the login node. You're talking something with full privileges, and it's running the application for you and handing back 
um, the X forwarded screen, to, which becomes your application screen. Um, and you can update the applications basically on the back end through like any type of repository system. In this case, I'm doing it through like Docker repository and stuff. So, um, and you can spit up new workers if you need more instances. So that's kind of where I've heard orchestration comes in handy is if like you can do pseudo load balancing with it as you detect stuff. So in this case, what I'm gonna show you is how I set, set this entire example up. Um, and the first thing I do is I run the, uh, I have a Docker Compose of the three containers that are running both the, the master and one of the builders. So I have, I have both a master, a builder, and then I have two workers that, are, that I'll individually start up. But in this case, I'll start showing you um, what the worker looks like and the fact that BuildBot does come with a GUI. So when you want to look at the dashboard, you can actually um, see what's going on and interact directly with it. So for your users, if they're doing stuff that requires uh, direct application launch, it might be useful. Um, and in this case, I'm going to um, its, its, local, um, uh, its, its local page, and you can look at you know, which, which one of your workers are up, which task can be accomplished with which workers. Um, the concept within BuildBot is that you tie very much the resources and the capabilities of a given worker to a specific job. So in some cases, maybe one worker can do two of the jobs or one worker can do three of the jobs depending on what application um, you want it for. And so in this case, you can actually see that I've started it up, but, in, but the workers are offline. Um, so really, I can't do anything until the workers come up. Um, and so you can simulate that as saying, well, I don't have any privileged resources of those where those application servers are actually running. Uh, and so, you know, I have to go start those up. So in this next part, uh, I'm then gonna, going to start, start this up and notice how dangerous this X, X host plus is. I'm just gonna point that out here. Um, I'm starting up each of the workers uh, and you'll notice that they'll connect to the, uh, to the master instance. And so in this, in this case, they're communicating with each other and hopefully when you look at the, um, the main page, I think I screwed up over here somewhere. Yeah, okay. Uh, when you look at the main page, you'll see that both of the, the workers are online. They're now green, and they're showing that they're capable and ready to work. Okay. And I think, yeah. So you can see the two names of the workers. So say you, you have a given application that can only run with that particular machine, um, or has a you know, given processor or, or mechanical uh, or um, computer setup, then yes, you would need that. And then I can actually start the job through this, either the change port or I can start it from the GUI. And in this case, I'm running Emacs, and uh, you, know, you say, okay, that's cool, that's just Emacs. Well, actually, this is running inside of a Docker container that's then being controlled from um, the, the, the actual BuildBot worker. So it, its ability to manage these is really useful when, when trying to you know, load balance your applications or prevent or, or be able, being able to administer your applications um, if you're an IT um, administrator of some type. So let's see. So the next one, um, hopefully, will show a little bit more information about what you can actually see from this side. So say your application, you can see who ran it for how long. Um, you can see how many times it was run and who's currently running and how many things are being used. Um, so I think those, all those are really important. And again, you can see the, um, the sim-linked call. So in this case, instead of calling it directly from the, uh, the GUI, um, from the dashboard, I'm then going to call it from the same way through the, uh, uh, through the command line that's been sim-linked all the way through. And again, you can see it start up and then it's running um, and you can see the current state. So in terms of uh, being able to proof, make proof of concepts very quickly with this, it's, it's super useful when you want to see what's going on underneath the hood, especially with the, uh, with the dashboard. Uh, but again, I want to stress that this is really, really just super useful for proof of concepts and that you know, maybe this would be uh, better if you migrated to, to something else as um, you figure out what your needs are as you go into a production system. So again, you can see that these are two completely different um, Docker instances of Emacs running. Um, and as we close them, you can, you can start seeing them uh, uh, cordoned off and everything. Cool. So in terms of a floating license, right? So it, it, you don't have to do too much different in that previous case to now do a floating license. So um, the license can e either be held by the, um, by the database that's attached to the BuildBot master instance, or you can use some type of uh, uh, 
actual build logic within your build scripts to accomplish that. So again, it doesn't seem too different from the previous example, um, and I'll hopefully show it here. Now let's see, I might, I might have to fast forward this. <laughs> the sake of time. Okay, so I'm gonna force one of them to start immediately. Um, and so let's just assume I have two um, pools, or I guess I have one pool with two, with two slots, right? So instead of those being machines, they're now instances, because you can uh, start up the BuildBot workers on, the, on your whim. So maybe you have one machine that has 50 of these workers, and that becomes your, your resource pool, right? Um, so now I have one started up, and now I'm gonna try to start up a second. Um, let's see, might have to fast forward through, it. okay, do I get it eventually? All right, cool. So once the second one starts up, um, you'll, you'll notice that both, both of the workers have now been taken up. And so right now they're, they're flashing yellow because they're both being taken up. So if this was your resource pool or this was your, um, your license, the amount of licenses that you had for the given application, you can then block the next time and, and queue to the next person that actually accesses it. And then when that other person closes it, the next person in line gets it. So in terms of queuing for the users, uh, this is really useful in kind of an enterprise-ish environment where maybe someone says, okay, they're gonna be using the application until lunch. I'm just gonna queue myself. I'm gonna go to lunch, come back, and hopefully I'll have landed my, my session by then, right? So, you know, if I, if I take one out, I can then um, queue one, which I just showed, and then the next one will start up, and now both people, again, the next person in line has it. So it, you can use, again, the thought of this pattern, what, what exactly here is abstract? The workers are abstract as either pieces of the resource pool, or they can be used as another part of the whole as a license server, um, or how many licenses you have, or you can spin them up on demand based upon load. So, um, a lot the, the types of things that I've actually done in industry to you know create like a proof of concept or give um, maybe a small company one way of actually creating their their own internal infrastructure is by using something like this so we've done it I've done a, a session a compute session Linux handler um, so you can then use the X, x1140 like I just showed to pull that off um, I actually have like a home machine learning ser server which I use to kick off jobs and it constantly computes uh, uh, geographic data as, as it's updated. Um, and so uh, th to go back to the previous example of one that worked, um, the compute server was a little more, con um, uh, a little more complicated than the one, the one that I showed in the video. So um, we did have a login node that we had to model that was a smaller machine that had smaller processors, and then we had one that was a large server farm, and we used those that had full, um, uh, full resources and privilege to have there. Um, with the workers, and then with BuildBot Master and the session queue, you would keep those for the people who are logging into that node. And so with the landed sessions, um, we were able to scale this, I think, to maybe about, I think the most I've ever seen was maybe three or 400 users, and these, this was on a very small setup, like with a login node of maybe one machine. So I think that, you know, in terms of proof of, making a proof of concept for what your infrastructure should like, should be like, then, you know, it, it would be uh, useful at that point. And then as you try to uh, scale it up to something else, you can look at other, uh, other types of infrastructure components to pull that off. The machine learning server that I implemented use, utilizes more of the continuous integration components. So um, I actually have a BuildBot master again with the session queue. The worker that's basically running all the time actually pulls from a live data source. And then when things have updated correctly and it gets enough aggregate data, it then sends it off to the compute workers and then posts that back on my screen. And that's all automated on my, like, you know, right above my couch, I have this monitor that runs all this stuff so I can see what the, you know, the aggregate data for, the, for that thing is. So, um, again, this is another utilization of the components, but for a completely different purpose. So, in summary, um, 
you, with a little bit of ingenuity and creative use of components, you can really pull together a lot of infrastructure design patterns that appear in like software and IT with creative, you know, freedoms because as more of, of these weird frameworks and technologies get released, your, your, your ability to create new and exciting uh, infrastructure patterns just get, get better. So um, being able to rapidly uh, design these things with, with this method allows you to look at inherent problems in maybe the way you've set things up uh, before you go to a full scale um, setup. Um, and I'd also like to state that, remember the examples here are not shown with any security or orchestration, so just be very wary of that. And then, you know, one of the things that you can do also is just keep an eye on the upcoming technologies that show up. I remember trying to do this before the days of, you know, really trendy Linux containers, and it was pretty difficult in some instances, and, you know, that just opened the doors up for other things. The orchestration technologies opened up another door of things you can possibly choose to do. Um, and then you can experiment with new tools often and see what patterns can be made next. Okay, it's just the billbot and questions. No questions. No questions. <laughs> okay, we have one question. Thanks. Uh, do you have any experience with uh, BuildBot Travis, which is providing a Travis uh, YAML file integration into BuildBot? No, uh, no, but I have started looking at experimenting with it. I was really excited when I wanted to make some of my own open source projects built with it. Um, and I haven't really gotten the chance to experiment with it, but I, I do look forward to experimenting with it. Another question? There's one here. Great talk, thanks. You mentioned that a lot of these are proof of concept and the security needs to be worked on. Um, are you gonna pursue that at all to give uh, people tips on how they could secure it or is that kind of left to the user to figure out? I, I mean, I think with how different um, a lot of infrastructures are with different companies and you know, this is more in the domain of IT, IT security, which is less of an area that I was in, um, I would really just, I don't have that much, that many tips to give. I just know that I've left a lot of holes open and I'd like to trust, um, you know, my, my network IT guys and, and security guys about what they, what they think should be done in this case. Any more questions? Thanks, David. Give him a big hand. <laughs>